we go. Okay, endocrine abnormalities and weight gain. Okay, a little bit about me. I'm a licensed and registered dietitian nutritionist. I also have my own private practice called Viva Total Health. I am a lead clinical nutritionist for RWJ Barnabas Health at Jersey City Medical Center. My website is as noted, vivatotalhealth.com. And I also have a YouTube cooking channel. If you just type in Viva Total Health, you'll be able to find that as well. I have two amazing interns. Um, one intern, Shifra, she is a dietetic student at Rutgers and another James, who is a master's student at Kane University for exercise science. And they're both helping me out on this YouTube cooking channel project. So I'm really grateful for them. They're doing a really incredible job. So please check it out. Okay, so with the rise in obesity, we wonder what the causes of this global pandemic may be. Obesity is a multifaceted disease problem that's not just affecting our own country, but it's affecting the entire world. If you break down the word disease, you have dis-ease. And according to the CDC, in 2019, 36.5% of the U.S. adults and 17% of children were obese. This means about more than 120 million adults and almost 13 million children under the age of 18 were clinically obese last year. However, this number is likely to be much more today. Astounding, isn't it? In a country that has everything, obesity increases the risk of diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, morbidity and mortality, kidney disease, depression, hormonal dysfunction, social and mental anxiety and disorders, isolation, and more. Okay, so we know that nutrition, stress, and physical activity have a direct relationship in regards to predicting health and weight outcomes. However, many individuals struggle with weight loss even with healthy diet choices and an increase in physical activity. So what might this reason be? Nutritional imbalances, chronic inflammation, problems with metabolism and your mitochondria, intestinal dysbiosis, changes in the microbiome, insulin insensitivity, genetics, and more may be the reason for weight loss, resistance, or the inability to lose weight. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about one of the number one reasons for weight loss resistance, which is hormone imbalances. One of the hormones that causes the biggest change in weight gain and an increased likelihood of disease is having too much insulin. Insulin is a hormone made by the pancreas that allows your body to use sugar and carbs in the food that you eat to be used for energy or to be stored for future use. It allows your muscles, fat, and liver to absorb the glucose in the blood to use for energy. Insulin also helps to keep your blood sugar levels from getting too high, which is known as hyperglycemia, or too low, which is known as hypoglycemia. Shifting insulin to not store fat, but instead to burn fat, is one of the key factors to losing weight. Three other hormones that have a big impact on weight and metabolism are thyroid, stress, and sex hormones. According to the American Thyroid Association, more than 12% of the U.S. population will develop a thyroid condition during their lifetime. Women are five to eight times more likely to be affected than men. About 20 million Americans have some form of thyroid disease, and about 60% are undiagnosed or not aware of their condition. Diet, nutritional deficiencies, stress, environmental toxins all impact the thyroid. Your thyroid needs specific nutrients in order to function properly, such as selenium, zinc, iodine, and omega-3 fatty acids. Most physicians do not test for thyroid function properly and miss out on a lot of the information that the body's trying to tell us. And when the thyroid is tested, most oftentimes it's not treated properly when the patient is diagnosed. Getting the right test is a great start and make sure to ask your doctor to test for TSH, free T3, free T4, thyroid antibodies such as TPO, which is thyroid peroxidase, and anti-thyroid globulin antibodies, and lastly, reverse T3. Reverse T3 can be blocked by pesticides, heavy metals, yeast, or even caused by nutritional deficiencies such as selenium, vitamin D, or zinc. 
Reverse T3 is a byproduct of thyroid hormone metabolism. So when T3 is measured high in lab testing, T4 or T3 is most likely impaired. If reverse T3 is too high and your regular thy thyroid hormones test normal, your thyroid is not functioning properly or optimally. To eat right for your thyroid, you want to limit or eliminate soy products, raw cruciferous vegetables such as kale, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and cabbages. These foods contain goitrogens, which blocks the thyroid from functioning at its best because it blocks iodine absorption, interferes with TPO, and may reduce TSH. It's best to eat these types of foods cooked because it breaks down the myrosinous en enzyme which reduces the goitrogens found in these particular foods. Make sure to include foods such as pumpkin seeds, sunflower seeds, Brazil nuts, seaweed, fish, oysters, baked beans, whole grain pasta, and cheese in your diet because of the iodine content, which your thyroid needs in order to function properly. The craze about Himalayan pink salt, which I fell for two years back until I did my research, lacks iodine. In a country that does not eat enough fish or seaweed, iodized salt was the only source of iodine for most individuals. Less than half a teaspoon of iodized salt can cover your daily needs. Also increasing your selenium is a great idea. Consuming one Brazil nut will help you meet over 150% of your daily selenium needs, which is important for a healthy thyroid function and reducing inflammation while boosting immune system health. Okay, now on to our stress hormones, specifically cortisol. Stress is thought to be a real or imagined threat to your body. So most oftentimes you may be worrying about fearful towards or even a projection of the future that didn't even happen yet. Stress can stem from physical, mental, and emotional stressors, which all in turn affects your stress hormones. We may not know it or feel it. However, we carry these stressors for a long time and they don't just go away. You know, they often build and build and build. And many of us know it as PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder, which can show up in many forms. Stress causes so many different hormonal responses in the body that causes inflammatory responses and can lead to weight gain and insulin resistance. Cortisol is a glucocorticoid, an adrenal hormone made by the adrenal glands specifically in the zone fasciculata. That stimulates your fight or flight responses. Cortisol has a bad rep though. However, we need cortisol. Cortisol helps you to react to danger. However, it also shuts down your digestive system during the process and it slows down your metabolism. The blood flows away from the digestive system as a form of protection. It's a protective mechanism to fuel all the other important organs. Long-term stress and high levels of cortisol can lead to hyperglycemia, increased belly fat, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, and possibly muscle loss due to hormonal imbalances, especially with estrogen and testosterone. So starting a yoga practice, daily meditation, getting enough sleep, eating a plant-based diet, making more time to be with friends and family, laughing, and um, all these are ways of helping to decrease stress. You know, back to estrogen and testosterone, these hormones matter in more ways other than being important for reproduction. Too much estrogen in women and men can cause weight gain. Too many refined carbs, high sugar in the diet, high stress, poor sleep, all can spike estrogen because they increase fat in the body tissue and estrogen is produced in the fat. This is one of the reasons why we see men and women with large bellies and men with gynecomastia or enlarged breasts. Eating a diet with plenty of vegetables and foods high in fiber helps to rid of the extra estrogen that can recirculate in the body if it is not excreted in the bowels. This is why daily regular bowel movements are so important. Your body makes estrogen daily, but if your bowels do not move the estrogen as well as other toxins in your gut, will recirculate back into your body. Xenoestrogens found in pesticides act like estrogen in the body. And they're also known as estrogen disruptors. 
Symptoms of estrogen imbalances in women include strong PMS symptoms, heavy bleeding during periods, fibroids, fluid retention, and in men, it can cause loss of hair, enlarged belly, gynecomastia, and decreased testosterone. Ways to balance your hormones and decrease inflammatory, um, decrease your risk of inflammatory diseases include physical activity, decreasing or eliminating alcohol, eating a balanced diet with lean protein, fiber from vegetables, fruits, and whole grains, and healthy fats such as avocado, chia seeds, hemp seeds, ground flax, nuts, and fatty fish such as salmon are great ways. Incorporating these points will help you to lose fat and increase muscle, which is a great way for helping to balance hormones and stimulate weight loss. Getting tested for hormonal imbalances may be a great idea so you and your doctor can get a better idea of what is going on and how to follow through with treatment. Working with a registered dietitian is also another great idea as we are knowledgeable in helping the individual to make successful diet and lifestyle changes and choices. Now, digestion. Digesting our food plays a huge role in our weight status. Digestion first starts when we see or smell food. You can feel the saliva in your mouth start to kick in when your favorite meal is being prepared. Chewing plays a big role in digestion. When you take a bite of food and you start to chew your food, the saliva in your mouth mixes with your food. In your saliva, you have a digestive enzyme called amylase, which specifically breaks down carbohydrates. Chewing your food well, most oftentimes 20 to 27 times per bite, um, allows for the carbs to break down and your food to be in the smallest bits of pieces possible. The food then travels down your esophagus and into your stomach where proteins are broken down by a digestive enzyme called protease. Your stomach is so acidic that if you touched it with your finger, it would literally burn. This is to help activate the protease enzyme and to kill off bacteria ingested with the food. This is one of the many reasons why I ask uh, my patients and my clients if they take any PPIs or proton pump inhibitors. PPIs coat the stomach, which then increases the pH of the stomach to become more alkaline. PPIs have horrendous side effects and can increase the risk of gastric neoplasia, which is stomach cancer, kidney disease, bone fractures, impaired micronutrient absorption, dementia, and liver disease. I can go on about this, this topic and everything about the digestive system. It's one of my favorites. Anyway, B12 can only be absorbed by way of combining with intrinsic factor in the acidic environment of your stomach. Intrinsic factors of protein in the stomach. Low B12 can lead to hematological and neurological disorders, as well as fatal cardiovascular diseases. Also, the acidity of the stomach allows for calcium absorption in the small intestine. Ghrelin is produced by the enteroendocrine cells. Entero meaning gut, and endocrine meaning the glands that secrete hormones. It is produced in the stomach and small intestine, and some is released in the brain and pancreas. Ghrelin is your hunger hormone. It helps you to increase your food intake and controls your appetite. It is the highest before eating and lowest after eating. Leptin is produced by your body's fat cells. It is your satiety hormone and it targets the hypothalamus. It lets you know when to stop eating. However, there is also something called leptin resistance. In obesity, people in obesity, because fat cells produce leptin in proportion to their size, people who are obese also have very high leptin. So you would think that people who are obese should naturally limit their food intake, right? Because their brain should know that they have plenty of energy stored. In obesity, leptin signaling may be defective because the brain is not receiving that signal. The brain actually thinks that the body's starving, encouraging you to eat more and burn less. Adequate sleep is important for keeping our hormones in check. We need at least seven to nine hours every night of quality sleep. 
This is where your body recharges itself like a battery. Uh, tissues build and repair, and all this helps to reduce stress and inflammation, prevents cancer and depression, and helps you to lose weight. Lastly, being physically active, at least 30 to 60 minutes per day is ideal. Your body's meant to move. Exercise has the ability to reduce insulin levels and increase insulin sensitivity. Aerobic exercise, strength training, and endurance exercises are shown to help increase insulin sensitivity and reduce insulin levels. There was a study performed over 24 weeks um, of obese women that showed that participants increased their insulin sensitivity and levels of a hormone called adiponectin that has anti-inflammatory effects and regulates metabolism after they start to increase exercise. Walking is another great way to help balance your hormone levels and overall quality of life. A goal of 10,000 steps per day most days of the week is excellent for cardiovascular health, fat burning, and reducing stress. So to summarize, eat a balanced diet full of protein, fiber, and healthy fats, sleep, quality sleep, at least seven to nine hours um, every night, reduce your stress, um, exercise daily, and something that I didn't mention before and um, I should have is to drink enough water, drink plenty of water. Your body cannot survive without water. And to make sure you get valid and truthful information from your physician and registered dietitian regarding your nutritional needs. Try not to rely on Google. <laughs> Any questions? Very good, Alice. Um, you do have one question coming in here uh, right away. Uh, there's Dr. Bo in the audience. I guess she oh, knows you. A horror student. <laughs> Yeah, she's, she has hypothyroidism. Uh, she takes a multivitamin. What other supplements do you recommend? Oh, Dr. Ball, I'll call you later because I also want to know everything else that you're on as well because I don't want to say something and then there could be like implications with other medications. But that's a really good question. Gotcha. All right, so you got some stuff coming in here. Um, you see the chat feed? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you just, I mean, you, you don't need me to do it. You can, uh, you, is you know. ramen bad for you? Uh, well, it's mostly carbohydrates and it's a very, very processed food. Um, I used to live on a college diet, so I totally get it. Um, so, you know, it's mostly carbohydrates and it breaks down to sugar, right? So you want to try to go for, you know, if you do ramen and I totally get, you know, um, you know, the college budget i lived on that or i tried to live on it um so make sure you add protein to it add some fiber to it um which are best ways so like maybe even if you go to the cafeteria add some grilled chicken uh, maybe some chopped broccoli peas carrots whatever you can to it and make it very colorful make it more nutrient dense that way cool there's a good question here on on the fats do you see that one Mm, okay, even for better endurance performance, high fat diets are recommended. What's your take on it to lose fat, eat fat? So our body needs fat, yes, in, uh, to burn fat. Yeah, that's correct. So our whole body relies on fat. Our brain needs fat in order to function well. Um, so I'm not a fan of these low fat diets at all. I, I'm not a fan of most diets. Um, I, it's really based on individual needs because each one of us, um, metabolizes food differently. So whenever I work with a patient or a client, one-on-one, uh, -on -one, everything is based on their own specific needs, what their goals are. Um, and, you know, if I see that, you know, they do well with a higher fat diet and they perform better and they have more energy, then let's go for it. Let's do that. Cool. Okay. Keto diet. Um, that's so funny. I had a few phone calls with, uh, potential clients earlier today regarding the keto diet. Um, again, I'm not a big diet fad person. Um, so it's really based on the individual's needs. I think that these fad diets, they last for a few months. You know, there's this huge craze about it. Um, people are all gung ho. And then after six months, it's like all the weight is back on. They're sluggish, they're tired, they're beaten down because they put all this energy into this you know, diet. And now they're not so sure what to do. So I would say save your money, save your time, and 
talk to a dietitian. You can call your insurance company and find a dietitian that is covered. Uh, you can email me or call me, um, you know, talk to your physician. They can refer you to a dietitian that we can get valid information because there's a lot of crappy information out there. Cool. Allie, there's also a couple questions in the Q and A section too. But, oh. uh, you got you have a lot of questions coming in. Just oh, good. I love questions. Okay, I'm oh. starting to take up everybody else's time. Um, my thoughts on taking a prebiotic and probiotic supplement. Okay, I think that they are great. There's a lot of crappy brands out there. There's a lot of good ones out there. Um, taking care of our gut microbiome is really really important because our gut microbiome um, is important for our hormones, digestion our mood, uh, I mean, the list can go on and on and on. A lot of my practice is based on the gut microbiome. Um, so I, I would talk to Caitlin, <laughs> call me later, and I'll help, um, I'll help you get on the right track with a good probiotic and prebiotic. That's a great question as well. The, the probiotics are the good bacteria for your gut, right? We have um, this symbiotic relationship in our, in our gut, right? We need good and bad bacteria um, in order to live and thrive. If we only had good bacteria, we'd be dead. So the probiotics are the good guys um, who live symbiotically with all the other bacteria in our gut. And then the prebiotics are the food for the probiotics so they can live and thrive. Uh, what would be the ideal diet for the average adult with low activity due to the quarantine? Um, yeah, great question. So, you know, try to get as much movement as you can. Our body's meant to move. Like, even if you can go out, the, the weather is starting to get warmer, go out for walks. I go for walks um, every night with my fiance, who's a doctor, and he doesn't like doing it, but I make him do it anyway. <laughs> um, but, you know, eating a lot of protein, um, enough protein in your diet for females, um, about 20 to 30 grams. Um, with breakfast, lunch, and dinner, more than half of your plate should be covered with vegetables, right? And also add your healthy fats. Like I mentioned before, the avocados, nuts and seeds, um, you know, adding uh, fatty fish in there is a great idea for the omega-3s th omega as well. Okay. How do you feel about protein supplements post-workout and are they really effective? Um, okay. You know, a lot of this, a lot of these protein supplements and things from GNC and vitamin, uh, vitamin shop, uh, not to knock them, but if you look at the ingredients, it's shit. <laughs> and um, sorry if there are any kids listening, but it uh, it really irks at me because so many people, it's a multi-billion dollar industry and they spend so much money on marketing to get you to buy their products. Don't fall for it. You know, a lot of it is more mental than what it's actually doing good for you because there's a lot of ingredients in there that cause inflammation in your body and you just want to be aware of that. Um, so again, talk to your physician, talk to a registered dietitian, um, email me. My email was at the beginning of this presentation. Um, you can also um, uh, get my email from Matt as well. Cool. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> we, have we have time for a couple more. Yeah. Okay, okay. The process to becoming a registered dietitian. Okay, let me tell you, it ain't freaking easy. It took me a long time to get to where I am today. Um, a lot of trial and error. I didn't think I wanted to become a registered dietitian in the beginning. I mean, Dr. Bo can tell you. Um, I, I, did, I never even thought I wanted to work in a hospital. I wanted to help people outpatient. So I was like, oh, maybe I don't need to be a registered dietitian to do that. Um, and then I realized, okay, you do you definitely need to be a registered dietitian um, you, to get the experience. And the fact that I can help people in the hospital and out of the hospital, especially during the COVID situation, um, and you know, with tube feeding, TPN, which is to total parental nutrition, when the gut isn't working, we have to feed them um, through the vein. It's, um, it's really heartwarming that you can feed somebody who is on a vet, right? Um, who is like life or death and their life is pretty much in your hands in the doctor's hands in the nurse's hands and when you know on the next day you go in to check on them and then you know they're alive and they're awake it's so um it's a feeling you can't describe and um so i i get both ends of it i love my private practice because i get to educate um people as well but going becoming a registered dietitian um 
email me because it's a long process. And um, yeah, I'll be more than happy to uh, to talk to you privately about that. All right, um, Allie, do you have any uh, contact information that you could share? Uh, so um, it's so if you go to my website, vivatotalhealth.com. Um, my email is Allison, A-L-L-I-S-O-N, at vivatotalhealth.com. I'm going to type it in um, into the chat Perfect. so all of you can, um, can check it out. And uh, yeah, I, I, my, my phone is on me 24-7 because all of my patients and clients have me 24-7, so I'm pretty, um, pretty fast at answering and responding to everybody. So, thank you so much for your questions. I really appreciate everybody. Thank you, Allie. Very good. Yeah. Um, okay. I have a I have a quick poll again. Hey, Matt. Yeah. So one of the questions that came in to Allison was about intermittent fasting. Okay. We have you might guys want to talk about that for a minute. Yeah. Um, so there's a very very good overview of this topic in the December 26th issue of the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, it's easy to read. Um, and so I would suggest that the, that would be the best place because otherwise you'll get stuck in the minutia of research. Gotcha. All right, so whoever asked that question, there you go, all right? Also, uh, uh, oh, not, not to like budge in, but um, Dr. Serena Chen, who is the director of um, IVF over at St. Barnabas Hospital at Livingston. Um, I, she refers her patients over to me and we had a panel talk about intermittent fasting, which you can find on my YouTube channel. Um, it's a little bit hard to hear, but um, if you put your volume on really loud, you'll be able to hear it. And we talk about intermittent fasting in there. Great. All right, so guys, take a second, get on this poll, all right? I got a poll about veggies. Let's see what kind of diet you guys are following right now. All right, um, most of you are in the middle. You do the right thing. There's a couple carnivores out there. <laughs> and then some of you guys just go overboard with the uh, vegetables. You're going six or more. Woo, yeah. And yeah, that's great. <laughs> more veggies. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. All right, uh, Allie, very good. Uh, very good, thanks again. Thank you for uh, having me, I appreciate it. Yep. So our next presenter is a very special guest. This is gonna be Tom Langton. He's the head strength coach at Gabriel Fitness in Berkeley Heights. Um, he's gonna to talk to you about his nutrition program that he does with his clientele um, at his facility. So without further ado, Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you, sir. Let me share my screen here. I got a little PowerPoint for you guys. So I'm gonna go 